I tell you what, we are in the midst of a series, I guarantee you. I believe it is one of the most important series I've taught in 20, I don't know how many years it's been. How many years have we pastored this church? I can't remember. 23, 24, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, this is life-changing. Life-changing. How many have the book? If you don't have the book, you can get one at the bookstore, but uh, it'll help you review what we're talking about. And again, this is life-changing stuff. So let's dive into it. Now, if you're visiting, you can help me out today because these that are around you have been in this for maybe five weeks. So you can help me judge their ability to answer the questions. We're going to ask questions, and I know you won't have the answer, but you can help me by uh, just judging how well the person next to you is taking notes and answering questions. Because as I always say, if you can't teach it, you can't live it. And this is something you have to get. All right, so... All right, so we're going to ask the first question. What is the key scripture for our series, everyone? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. Let's read that. It says, Then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did his. Again, I'll just take a brief review. Uh, this is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. So it says there is a Sabbath rest for you to understand what that means, you need to define the terms. What is a Sabbath rest? To give you a quick update on that, if you go back in the beginning, Adam and Eve had it all, and they lost it all. Satan deceived them out of their position in the earth realm as agents for the kingdom of heaven. They had the Garden of Eden. They never had to care about worry or, um, I mean, food or sickness. They had Death was a foreign concept to them. But uh, they gave it all away. They rebelled against God, lost their provision, and God, meeting them after that rebellion, says, okay, you've tied my hands. Now, by your own painful toil and sweat, you have to make your way through life because you've tied my hands. I can't provide for you. You'll have to make your own way. That's called the earth curse system, I call it. That's where you grew up. It's the kingdom of fear, the kingdom of survival, and that's where every decision is made about finding money, hoarding money, you know, the weight of running after provision, that's where we grew up at. And because of that, God gave Adam a picture of what he would someday restore back to mankind where he didn't have to run and sweat, and that was called the Sabbath day. Okay, I'll let that one go. Next time, get it right. The Sabbath day, everyone's heard of the Sabbath day, denominations fight over the Sabbath day, but the next time you're in a discussion with someone about the Sabbath day, if it's Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, or whatever, you need to pull out a verse in Colossians, chapter 2, verse number, Drinda, I know you know the answer, sweetie, let them answer. <laughs> All right, so Colossians chapter 2, let's say it, say it together. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Say it one more time. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. And this is an important scripture. Verse 16, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of of the things that were to come, the reality, however, is found in Christ. So the Sabbath day was a picture, only a picture, no reality. It couldn't, in itself, could not set you free from the painful toil and sweat system, but it was a picture of what was to come and what could they not do on the Sabbath day. It couldn't work. They couldn't painfully toil and sweat. And so it was a picture of that God is going to restore back to man provision outside of just eking it out, just surviving and making it happen to, you know, week by week, you know, year by year. And so that was a picture. Now he gave them another picture. It was called the Sabbath year. And so what could they not do on the Sabbath year? Again, they could not harvest. They could not painfully toil and sweat. Yet they're well taken care of. See, God was showing them there's another system, another way of living with provision outside of the painful toil and sweating earth system that we've all grown accustomed to. And the year of Sabbath, the Sabbath year also showed one other shadow or attribute of that restoration, which was what? 
all debt was erased. So every seven years, all debt was erased. And why? That's the shadow. You have the reality. The shadow says you have the ability to live above the earth curse system of just surviving. And debt is an insufficient system. There's, there should be no insufficiency in God's kingdom, correct? Okay. So if all debt's forgiven, and that's a picture of what God's going to restore, then that means you have the ability to live above debt. Now, before you kind of tilt on me and kind of go, because, you know, 90% of people live by debt in the, in the U.S., just hang with me for a minute, okay? Now, there's one more picture called the year of Jubilee. That's every 50 years. And it followed a Sabbath year, which was the 49th year. So they couldn't sow their crops in the 49th year, and the year of Jubilee said they couldn't sow their crops again. No painful toil and sweat. So now, how are they going to survive? God is giving them a bigger picture because they're very well provided for during the three years. 49th year, Sabbath year, couldn't do their crops. 50th year, they can't sow their crops. And the 51st year, it takes all year to raise their crops. Well provided for because the 48th year provided enough for three years. Harvest was so huge. So this, the year of Jubilee gave us that shadow that, again, there's a way to live above the earth curse system of painful toil and sweat. And students, two more attributes the shadow tells us that you have the reality of, which is uh, over here. All slaves were set free. And that is to indicate that in the kingdom of God, you're no longer a slave under the law. You are now a son and daughter of the house, which means you have the inheritance and you own the house. That's Ephesians chapter 219. And the last thing it shows us, all property was given back to its original owner. So during that 50 years, if by chance you had to mortgage it, you lost it, you had to sell it to pay bills, whatever the case, it was given back to you every 50 years back to the original owner. So that's the shadow. What is that telling you? That you have your prosperity back. Because if you had land, you had potential, you could raise crops, you could enjoy your prosperity, correct? So all of those shadows are reality. The Bible says you have, I didn't make it up, the Bible says you have a Sabbath rest. New Testament, is that right? You have the ability to tap into all of those things restored. Those are all just pictures of what Jesus restored back to us. Now, we have to ask many questions today because so many people are not enjoying the benefit of those things, but we'll get to that. As long as you understand what the picture is trying to tell us, we can, we can move on. Now, we're going, going to go to Exodus chapter 16, another scripture that we've covered through this series that you probably know it speaks about the manna. So we're going to begin to dig into how is the Sabbath rest possible? So, Pastor, you say there's a Sabbath rest available to me, which has in it the reality of all of those attributes that the shadow of those events, those special days and years, showed me that I have in Christ. All right, so we know that that's available, but how do I tap in to the Sabbath rest? Inquiring minds want to know. Right? Okay. So in Exodus chapter 16, we find the answer. They had the manna that it came down in the, eve, uh, in the morning, and they would gather it, and it would last until about noon, and then it would evaporate or rot, and they couldn't gather it, except one day it would last overnight, and that would be the sixth day. The seventh day is the Sabbath day. They couldn't painfully toil or sweat, so we find this in the 27th verse here of Exodus chapter 16. Moses is explaining to the Israelites about the Sabbath day. He says, and it goes on, it says, Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather the manna, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, that is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. We call that the double portion. So in your notes, you should find, and now visitors, this is where you come in. You can check the notes of the person next to you and see if they have this written down. The Sabbath rest is only possible by the double portion. 
The Sabbath year was only possible by the double portion. The sixth year provided so much harvest, double the amount, to carry them through the seventh year. The year of Jubilee was only possible because of the triple portion, actually. The 48th year provided for the 49th year, the 50th year, and the 51st year. All right, so the Sabbath rest is only possible by the double portion. You'll only find yourself, your spiritual identity, when money no longer controls you. When you're living hand to mouth and you're living as a slave in the earth realm, trying week by week to find your existence, you don't, you don't have options. You're a slave and slaves don't have options. You have to have the double portion. You have to have more than enough to have the ability to dream beyond Friday night because slaves only dream of stopping. All right, let's move on. So the Sabbath rest is only available by the double portion, so we got to answer another question. How do I tap into the double portion? We talked about this two or three weeks ago. Again, this is the sixth installment in this series, and if you don't have all of the information, you can get it online or get it from our, work, our uh, bookstore. It's free. But Mark chapter 6 tells us the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men. Men, which meaning probably 15,000 people, counting women and children, or 20,000 people, right? And so you know the story. The bread multiplies, and the Bible says they were satisfied. That's good. Satisfied's good. I like satisfied. But John, in John's version of the story, in the book of John, chapter 6, we find another picture of this same story. And it says, Jesus, this is verse 11, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So the double portion was the 12 baskets that were left over. Satisfied did not pick those fragments up. Jesus had to tell them to pick the fragments up, correct? So we have to understand that Jesus had to tell them where the double portion was and to gather it. And especially in the earth curse system, when people have been trained their entire life that when I finally get a million dollars saved or when I finally come to retirement or when I finally pay my house off, then I can rest, they're going to miss the whole boat. Because you must, you, this should be in your notes, should be big, bold letters, you must see past satisfied to tap into the double portion. You must see past satisfied Again, our problem is that we didn't know there was a double portion. And we didn't anticipate the double portion. We didn't ask Jesus to tell us where it's at because we didn't know it existed. But it's there. And I said, write this down in really bold print. God never sends provision only for today. He always sends the double portion. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over the double portion corinthians says that on every occasion you should be able to be generous you live in the double portion the kingdom no insufficiency the double portion all right let's move on now let me mention sarah's email sarah's on the line probably right now online campus she's in canada and she sent me this yesterday you probably remember sarah she's spoken many times at her provision conference and uh, her husband roger and her have a business and here's what she writes this was yesterday she says, on the average in my business, we make about $3,500 a week. Both of us combined a full week of labor. And I say labor because it is not always easy, and it can be very trying and frustrating at times. Now, this week, uh, this is her slow season. So, you know, she has cycles in her business, and this is her slow season. This week, we came into agreement, and we chose, everyone say chose, chose. to remove the fear of the lack of work that we believe we were seeing, so the slow, the circumstances can speak to you. It's just slow, it slows down. And we decided to look for fragments, the double portion. 
And what we found, I like what she said, what we found was epic. We discovered projects that were fun and exciting. There was no labor, no toil, and we didn't work a full week, and yet we invoiced for $10,300. This is a 294% income increase. Now, again, she's an accountant, so she used, you know, she puts it in the percentages. That's all right. For less work processed and, better yet, less time worked. All because we asked where the fragments were, and then we found fragments. These fragments have been available all since January. They used the free time, working less with their family, she goes on and says. I will also add that we found more fragments in our other businesses that we have, and that has revolutionized our finances as well. And we made some tough but necessary decisions financially, which also saved us money and increased our financial power. Wow, she says. What a difference. I cannot wait for this Sunday's message, she says. What's in store for us this week? Well, you're finding out, and you're part of it, Sarah. Thank you. (laughs) Now, here's what she said. If I could talk to all those who are listening to the Power of Rest series, and you are, I would tell them they need to marinate in every word Pastor Gary is speaking. It's not me speaking. It's the Word of God. And they need to start acting upon those words. I would tell them that the Power of Rest works if you work it. Do not just listen to the message and then choose to walk back into the habitual life that you've created. Instead, leave the service with determination to make this work, a determination to be the person God has called you to be, and choose to walk in what you've learned in that service. It's all about choice. What choice are you going to make today? Very good, Sarah. Thank you. So let's review. Jesus had to tell them, to pick up the fragments. We know that they were satisfied. I've covered this before, but when you're a slave and you're satisfied, you take a nap. Right? Again, slaves aim at stopping. Really, the goal of making more money is so they can stop. They can retire early or whatever, you know. It's all about stopping. So why don't we see the double portion? We talked about this, I think, last week. Why is the double portion not obvious to us? Isaiah chapter 45, 3, you read this last week. I will give you the, this is God speaking, I will give you the hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel. So, hidden treasures stored in secret places. Who are they hidden from? What is the the overflow hidden from? Our adversary, because he'd love to intercept that and use it against us or to stop the plan of God. Now, Jesus always spoke in parables, and his disciples would ask him, why are you always speaking in parables? Why can't you just tell us what you're, why don't you just tell us what you're trying to say? Why do you always have to tell us a story and then have to, have to interpret the story? Just tell us. And he, he, he answers their question. He says in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. Jesus, again, always used the phrase, to those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Meaning people that don't have a heart for God are not going to pick up what he's saying because he's trying to hide these things from the enemy. But people that have a heart for God are going to pick up by the Spirit the meaning of the story. All right? So it's hidden I always say, from you, but not really from you, for you. It's hidden from you, for you. Hidden from the enemy so you can receive it, okay? Because you're supposed to know those things, the hidden things. As the church, you have the ability to hear those things by the Spirit of God. Now, how long have birds been flying in the earth realm? A long time. How long has man been flying? 117 years or something like that, 100 and some years. What happened? I mean, they saw birds flying all those thousands of years. Why didn't someone figure it out and fly? What about electricity? It's been here all along. They saw the lightning. They saw it made light. They never figured it out. They couldn't see it. And that's how it is with the double portion. You have it. God's given it to you, but you can't see it. Why? A lot of reasons why. Uh, a lot of reasons, again, is your thinking in terms of survival, your, your mindset, your past experiences, uh, you know, your, your training to say no before you say yes. I mean, whatever it is, you're not seeing it, all right? 
and we have to change that. So today, I really feel by the Spirit of God, we must deal with our mindset. This is crucial. It is life and death. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we find a story that I want to point out. I love the story. I've taught from it many times. Verse number 1, chapter 4, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, what, how can I help you? How can I help you? Why didn't he say, well, you know, I'll just get the treasury out and we'll give you a couple bucks to take care of you for a couple meals? Because that's not going to fix her problem. She needs a life overhaul, not a handout. Does that make sense? She's got to own some, inv- she's got to own some investment property. She's got to have some assets to live on for a while. These boys got to grow up and she's got to take care of them. It's not just to give her a, a free uh, coupon or a gift card. So he says, well, how can I help you? What do you have in your house? What do you have in your house is a strange question. She says, your servant has how much? Nothing. Say it again. Nothing. nothing. Say it again. Nothing. Say it again. Nothing. 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 Don't have anything. Except a little bit of oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all of the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Now, just a side note, if she would have had three million jars, how many jars would have filled up? Three million. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. And so she's the first oil tycoon recorded in history. (laughs) But what I want to point out to you is this. When she was asked what she had, what she saw that she had, she said, what? Nothing. Nothing. When she received the word of the prophet and he said, go gather pots, what changed? Her picture. Everyone say her picture. Because she would never have enacted the plan to go gather pots if she did not see in her mind pots that were full of oil. Right? I mean, she has nothing. Why would she go and gather pots to put nothing in? She's gathering pots because she now sees a different picture of full pots. How did she get that picture to change? She received the word of God. The prophet carries the word of God. Now in the New Testament, you have the Holy Spirit in you, so a prophet does not tell you what to do. If someone tells you to go to Africa, you would would have known first. The Holy Spirit in you would have known first. Prophecy confirms in the New Testament, and it would be used to confirm direction, but never lead. But in that day, they did not have the Holy Spirit inside of them, and the prophet carried the word of God. So she received the word of God, she received what he said, and it changed her picture, and she received the oil. What I'm trying to say is this, a picture of nothing will get you nothing. If you consistently look at what you do not have, your inability, you, your inexperience, what you can't do, if that's all you see when you close your eyes, you're going to have nothing. Nothing cannot inherit the double portion. It can't see the double portion. It can't receive the double portion because it's looking all in the wrong direction. Another story, Peter, James, and John, fishing business, Luke chapter 5. Jesus borrows the, Peter's boat and then says, Peter... Cast your nets out in the deep water. Peter's a professional fisherman, and he says, we fished all night, already washed the nets, and we caught how much? How much? Nothing, 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 nothing. But Jesus says, cast your freshly washed nets over there in the deep water, and he says what? But because you say so, I will do that. When he cast the net in, what changed? Everyone say the word picture. 
when Jesus asked him the picture of his potential and who he was, what he had, he said, nothing. We fished, failed, nothing. But now, Jesus gives him a word of direction by the Holy Spirit, and he sees fish, literally in his mind. He sees fish, right? He follows the word of God because you say so, and his perception changes, and he sees fish. When Jesus fed the 5,000, they said, we've got to feed these people. We don't have anything. What, what should we do? He said, you feed them. <laughs> That's right, right. He said, go see what you have. They found five loaves and two fish. 20,000 people. He says, have the people sit down and began to pass it out after he blessed it. So what changed? Their picture. They came to him because their picture was, we are in lack. There's a problem. These people need food, right? And he said, you feed them. If you went to Jesus today and said, we have a problem. We need a bigger house. He'd say, buy it. If you went to Jesus today and said, you know what, we have a problem, we need a better running car, you know what he'd say? Buy it. You know, if, if you went to Jesus and said, you know, we really need something, then need, he'd say, buy it. Get it. Get your eyes off what you don't have and put your eyes on what you do have in the kingdom. There's 7,000 promises and they all declare what you have. I could title today's message, because he said so, or because you said so, I'll do that. You will never inherit the double portion looking at the nothing. You must change your mindset. You must change your mindset. I am convinced God wants you to have this worse than you do. Jesus said, let nothing be wasted. He rebuked Moses because the people were out gathering on the seventh day and did not gather enough. He wants you to have it. He wants you to have it. He is passionate about it. There are things that need to get done. He wants to pull you out of that survival thinking and out of that fear-based mentality of poverty. He's got to get your eyes off the nothing and onto the overflow, the blessing, the Sabbath rest, and the double portion. Well, obviously you can't see it now, but he's going to reveal it to you. But you have it nevertheless. Amen? Amen. Because you all agree, I didn't make it up. Hebrews says, you now have a Sabbath rest. So, let's talk about flying for a minute. I'll give you a personal example here. Drinda and I fly a lot. A couple years ago, I tracked one month, 23 times we flew. Now, if you have flown lately, I don't know if it's just getting worse out there or what the problem is, but if you have a connection, you already know, you pray, and you add a little luck to it. Because you know what happens with the connections. I mean, almost, I mean, literally almost half the time, you're sprinting to the next gate, or you're missing a flight, or you're spending the night some city you didn't plan on. Or, I mean, it's, and if you're flying for a living and you live out there in the airports, it's really tiring to deal with that on a day-by-day basis. I'm a pilot, so what would the answer be? An airplane. Again, you need a bigger house, the answer is a bigger house. You need a better car, the answer is a better car. But wait, you know what happens when I say that? Your mind goes, no, we can't afford that. No, we can't have that. No, I don't see any way it's possible. Because you have been so professionally trained in the no mentality of the survival earth curse system, you don't even give it a chance to envision a possibility of how it could come to pass. And I am guilty, just like you. We want God to come up and surprise us with it. Like, here it is. Like, we don't have anything to do with it. It's just going to show up in the mailbox. That's not going to happen that way. Gather the fragments, guys. You're stepping on them. You're going to have to be involved in the process. Okay. I'm a pilot. Besides that, we have a U.S. air captain on staff. Stephen Trailer professional pilot, U.S. Air Captain, has young kids, decides he doesn't want to leave his family four nights every week. And he comes and says, his wife, Sarah, you know, Sarah, she's on staff. He says, listen, is there anything I can do on staff? I just can't leave my family four nights a week. I knew why he was coming. He may not have known why he was coming. I knew he was going to fly our airplane, but we didn't have an airplane. I 
I mean, have you looked at the price of airplanes? They cost more than houses, maybe two houses, three houses. It, you know, they're, I mean, it's crazy expensive. And so what happens is you look at flying places, you know, you got to pay you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for an airplane and all this expense. And then you go in, and there's Allegiant, $40 one way to Florida. Well, why, do, why would I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars if I can hop on Allegiant at Rick? Y'all know about Allegiant, right? $40 to Florida. Why would I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars if I can just pay $40? That's what you do. Why should I have a bigger house? We can all cram in that one bedroom. Why would I think of, what, what's wrong with me? We can, we can make this work. <laughs> we can live in a pup tent in the state park. I mean, we can make it work. We can all cram in that Volkswagen Beetle. I mean, come on, right? You can, but do you want to? Do you have things to get done? You know, when we got out of debt, it was so nice. If something broke, we said, fix it. Instead of having to find money and get a credit card and try to figure out how to exist another week, I could be about my assignment instead of just trying to find a way to survive one week. Anyway, so I was battling that. You know, it's like, I don't know what plane, I don't know, God, I know I'm supposed to have a plane. I know I'm supposed to have a plane. You already brought the pilot, the pilot's here. I just can't see the plane, the plane, the plane. I just couldn't see it. So Miss Drenda will pick the story up right here. Let's welcome Pastor Drenda. Right. You know, the Israelites wandered around in the wilderness for how many years? Forty. But God gave them a promise. They had a promised land, but they couldn't enter into the rest. The Bible says they didn't enter into the rest of God because of unbelief. unbelief. They didn't believe what God told them about the promises. And instead, they wandered around, wandered around. It was there all along. And what did they do? They murmured and they complained against God, who'd given them the promises that they refused to believe. So who was at fault in this scenario? I think they and that's were. what we do in the body of Christ. So many times, we're, we're actually canceling out what God says we can have because we judge with our words. We speak negative words about situations, and we speak negative things about people we see get something. And the Bible says, as you judge, you will be judged. So when you're speaking words of judgment against what God says, against what uh, he says you can have, you won't be able to receive it because now you've judged yourself. Right, right. You've judged yourself unworthy to have it. So anyway, um, we were going through this dilemma, right? And during, the, during that two years, Stephen Trailer, our pilot, was on staff here. We had two years of, I mean, every nightmare that could go wrong flying happened. I mean, everyone. We even had one flight where we were coming from Colorado, left early in the morning, we're supposed to fly into Charlotte and then home. Instead of going to Charlotte, the plane has to divert to Greenville or where was Greensboro. it? Greensboro. So they land the plane, but we can't get off the plane because they don't have the right equipment to get us off that size of a plane. So we're stuck on the plane for five hours. And they delivered the delivery pizza truck came by. Yeah. They ended up At least bringing, they took care of us that way. Pastor and I were handing out or Ezekiel pizza. bread because we happen to have a loaf of Ezekiel bread. Sometimes we travel with, just in case we get stuck somewhere without food, we've got a loaf of Ezekiel bread. That's right. It's biblical. Anyway, <laughs> it sustained Elijah in the wilderness. It'll get you through. For two years, he, was, he lived on that. So anyhow, we were handing that out. We finally, we fly into Charlotte. We're exhausted. We've been flying all day. We stand in these long lines to get told that our flight's going to go out at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. So we're like, can we just spend the night and come back and fly out in the morning? We're so tired. And they're like, no, no, you have to fly in the day of your flight. You must fly. Okay, okay. Walk in love, walk in love. All right. <laughs> We wait, we get on the plane at 11 o'clock, and the snack truck that's supposed to put refreshments, which they barely give you anymore anyway, a couple of peanuts and a little drink, you know, so if you get that. So the snack truck smashes into the plane while we're on it. <laughs> so we get off the plane, and they say there will be another flight in 45 minutes. We got home at 2.30 a.m. and then came in and preached. 
And that's so typical. I mean, so many times behind the scenes, people that work here know what goes on. But sometimes I mean, you would be shocked if we ever come in here like wiped out. It's probably because we were left in some airport. Yeah. Last month, our plane was broken. We were left two times in airports, missed both connections. I was left in, I was flying from Iowa, supposed to go through Chicago, and they diverted to Springfield. You get off in Springfield, there is no gate. There is nothing. They're just like nothing. Allegiance closed. They have an Allegiant gate, and that's it. And so they say it'll be 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours before you get out of here. We rented a van and drove all night long just to get home because, you know, when you've been away, you just want to get home, right? You just want to get home to your kids, your grandkids, and you're like, 48 hours? I'm not going to be stuck in Springfield for 40 hours. And you could get in the flesh. You have to be careful. <laughs> anyway, we rented a vehicle, came home. So I digress. Anyhow, for two years, we were in that kind of situation, TSA issues, all kinds of issues. Meanwhile, we've got a pilot. Everywhere we go, we'll hear ministers say, would say to us, oh, I've got a plane. If I could just find a pilot. And I'm thinking, we've got a pilot if we just had a plane. <laughs> anyway, but I kept arguing from frugality, right? I kept saying, one plus one, no, no. That, I, we can fly this cheap. If we own a plane, it costs this much. And I kept adding the numbers. You know, I knew a lady that had come through the Depression. She was in her 80s. And I bought her a pair of gloves for Christmas. And I didn't really have a lot of money. So I was I really pinching to get her those gloves. Got her the gloves. She took me back to her bedroom, pulls open the drawer, sticks them in the drawer with about six other pair of gloves. Why? That because were still she came, in the box. Yeah, they the were way. still in the box, never been worn, because she came through the Depression. And when you come through a Depression, your mindset is stuck. It's stuck in where you came from. Your poverty mindset keeps you from seeing what you can do, what you can have, and that's where I was. And so I kept going, okay, we, could, we can fly. We can get stuck in all these places. We'll just keep doing this for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Suffering for Jesus. Well, Jesus wasn't calling us to suffer like that. I was calling us to that. So I happened to be in Colorado, and it just works out. We run into Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. No plan of that. Don't even know they're in the town, right? I mean, what's the chances of that, right? What's the chances of that? How much? <laughs> it makes me think of a time we caught someone in sin in our church in another state, completely away. <laughs> what's Can't, the chances get back on of topic, that? <laughs> get back on topic, sweetie. I know. I know. <laughs> God will find you, right? <laughs> he knows how to find you. So <laughs> I won't tell that story. I so want to tell it to you. Anyhow, okay, <laughs> just be careful. No. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'm in Colorado running to Kenneth and Gloria Cope, and we end up going to breakfast with them. I'm sitting across I from... I wasn't there. No, Pastor Gary's yeah. not with me. I'm with a friend, and I never do that either. I never go anywhere by myself. So now I'm with a friend. We're sitting across from Kenneth and Gloria. She's across from Gloria. I'm across from Kenneth Copeland. He's eating. I'm eating. All of a sudden, he sticks that finger up like this you know and those penetrating eyes look you in the eye you know something's happening right and he begins to prophesy to me and he said i've tried to send you houses and lands i've tried to bring you houses and lands but you wouldn't receive them people don't need your money they need faith just like you had to have to get what you got and i start shaking and tears are going down my eyes and i know exactly what he's talking about I know exactly, because we had been saving money. We had money saved, but in the back of my mind, because of where we came from, because of the farmhouse, because of times building the church and doing different things, because you love your family and you want to provide for people and you want to help people, in my mindset, I wasn't allowing myself to step into the blessing of God because I had all these excuses in the back of my mind from that poverty, earth curse mindset telling me, no, you can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. And so when he began to speak that, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I was shaking and crying and repenting. God loves you too much to leave you where you're at. He rebukes or he disciplines those that he loves. He was disciplining me because I wasn't allowing us to have a plane because of my mindset. I was requiring us to stay in the wilderness. The Israelites went around and around in the wilderness because of their mindset. They would not receive what God said and they kept rebuking basically God, but yet at the same time complaining complaining. Instead of speaking the promises, they were speaking doubt, unbelief, and murmuring. So then he goes, and about that plane, and I said, Mother Copeland. We've never talked about a plane. Yeah, we've never told anyone anything about yeah. a plane and talking about it. We were scared to, right? We didn't want to be one of those prosperity preachers with an airplane. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the wrong thinking too, right? Anyway, 
He goes, and about that play, and I said, Brother Copeland, can I get my phone out and record this for Gary? I won't put it on Facebook. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine? I look back and I think, he probably went, I'm giving you a prophecy for Pete's sake. <laughs> no, he wouldn't say that. Anyhow, so I pull out my phone and I begin to record it. And he goes, and about that plane, there's a plane out there that wants to go in the ministry with you. It's saying, please let me go into the ministry with you. Please let me fulfill my assignment. Please let me do what I was put on the earth to do. And I'm, oh, Jesus, I'm shaking. I'm like, thank you. You know, you can't eat your breakfast after that, right? <laughs> we ended up having lunch with him the next day. <laughs> so anyway, he, he started talking to me about frugality. He said, you know, that is a spirit of poverty, that frugality. He said, people need to glean from your overflow. How can you have overflow if you're so frugal? He says, you know how you know you're frugal? And I'm like, how does he know I'm frugal? <laughs> how does he know this, right? And he says, when you squeeze that last bit of toothpaste out, when you can't throw anything away until every little bit of it's gone, I'm thinking, oh, sheesh. So uh, my friend Patty, when she was helping me do some uh, work at the house, she goes, my gosh, Trina, she goes, you want everything to fulfill its potential. You've kept every little, I mean, like there's that much lotion left in the box, but I don't want to throw it away because that lotion was created created for potential. It's like, that's a misuse of that gifting, right? I want to bring potential out of people. Forget about a little bottle of shampoo, right? Anyway, so he dealt with that. And God was dealing with me about my frugal mindset, about not being able to receive. I could receive from Marshalls, but I couldn't receive from here. I had to go to the sale rack. I go to a nicer store, but I wouldn't let myself go anywhere but the sale rack. Anybody, am I talking to anybody? Okay, why do we do that? Because we think that there's lack. There is not lack in the earth. There may be lack in our finances because of the way we're seeing and thinking, but there's not lack. There's lots of money out there. There's lots of resources out there. See, the reason I couldn't receive is I was thinking in the earth curse system there's lack. And if I have something nice, I'm denying someone else something. I'm, th I'm, I'm keeping a poor person from being able to eat because I have a nice purse or I have a nice car or I have a plane to do ministry. That is not true. That is a lie. You and I have been, that has been propagated on us. There's plenty. There's plenty of resources. It's, it's governments that withhold and restrict and misuse and abuse people and keep them from having what God is blessing that nation with or yeah. blessing his people. All anyway, right. I got to go on. I know we do. You got to clock. All right. Okay, very good job. Okay. <laughs> good job. Stay right here. Stay right here. Stay right here. Stay right. Okay, so we received that rebuke. She gave me the video and I watched it and I knew we had to change. And I repented because it was me. God had Kenneth Copeland talk to me because I was the holdup. <laughs> I and was the problem. He wanted the plane, grand, but I kept telling him he couldn't have it. <laughs> I'm over here now, okay? I, I got to finish up. Okay, so, but here's the problem. I couldn't see the plane. I still couldn't see the plane. You know, I couldn't see the plane. I couldn't say by faith, I have that by faith. Okay? I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. So I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, you got to help me. I got to, you know... I, gotta, I, gotta, I don't know what plane. I didn't want a jet because I wanted to fly it. I mean, I, I'm not rated for jets, and I, I wanted to be able to fly the plane, so I didn't want a, a jet. But I didn't know what to get. So this is where Judd Ayers and Kara enter the picture. Uh, Judd, stand up, Judd. Stand up. Actually, just come up here real quick. You can do it really fast. So Judd here, how many days was it they told you you had to live before you died of cancer? Four. Four days you'd be dead and you're alive because you believe the Word of God. Amen. Amen. All right. So tell us what happened. One day you were leaving church, and God said to come back in. Is that how it was? Yes. Yeah, so I was at church, and um, one of my coaches and mentors, uh, he has a plane, and uh, he has a video that he made with that. And um, I was sitting down in church, and I'm like, for some reason, pastor needs to see this. And so I, I felt to myself, I'm like, no, 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 no. And so I left, and so I started driving home, and I got on the on-ramp, and I started taking off, and you guys were in the next service, and the Holy Spirit said, no, he needs to see this video. Wow. So I came back in, and at the end of the next service, I waited till the end, until everybody left, and I said, Pastor, you mind if I share something with you? And uh, I was like, hey, I shared this video with you, and uh, obviously the video is dream big. 
and uh, had the airplane in it and stuff like that. But uh, I was just really convicted. It was really to the point where I was like, I had to turn around and show this plane to you. Yeah, so, so you uh, showed me this plane, and I didn't, I didn't know about the planes, but it was a Piper Malibu, uh, and I have a Piper Warrior. I have a, a four-seat plane that I fly, but I, I needed one to travel with, and that was it, because it's in the same you know, structure as the one I'm used to, but just bigger, and uh, it flies you know, 25,000 feet. It's pressurized, 250 miles an hour. I mean, for what it does, it's perfect for what I wanted, and I, that's, that's it. That, that picture, that's, that's the plane. And so we came into agreement for that plane. I think we had it within a month or two. We had the plane. It was fast. It was fast. <laughs> so thank you for being obedient. Amen. 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 Thank, you. thank you. But a different picture. A different picture. A different picture. And God wants you to get the picture. You know? And so you've got to stop saying no and start saying how. We've been trained. In fact, i got a stat here I pulled out in the no training. Um, we have been trained to say no before we even think about possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, the one study says that a child hears the word no over 148,000 times while growing up compared to just a few thousand yeses. Wow. So we're trained to say no. And we're trained to judge things by our past and what we have. But you'll never receive the double portion with that mindset. And, I, and God wants you to have it. He had Judd turn around because he wanted me to have the plane. We knew we were to have a plane, but we needed to change the picture before it could show up. And you need to change the picture. There's 7,000 promises. Every promise carries with it a picture.